Dimensionless variables can also be used for scaling, chemical and biological processes, and unit operations. Dimensionless variables by their nature are intensive because they don't measure the size of a system or the absolute amount of material or energy in a system. When scaling processes and unit operations, we can expect similar behavior if the dimensionless variables are held constant across different scales. Consider the example that we looked at earlier of the tubular reactor. The model for the tubular reactor in dimensionless form has only two dimensionless variables, a dimensionless concentration and a dimensionless position down the length of the reactor. This model has no information about the size of the system because it's expressed entirely in intensive variables which are independent of the size. This could be describing anything from a microfluidic device to an enormous chemical reactor. The point is that we can expect similar behavior for chi as a function of zeta regardless of the system size. When scaling from a small scale to a large scale for a unit operation, we want the two systems to behave similarly. In this case, similarity has a particular meaning. Two systems are similar if the intensive quantities describing them are the same. The intensive variables include the dimensionless variables. The Buckingham Pi theorem helps us to minimize the number of dimensionless variables that we need in order to describe a process, so we can use these dimensionless variables for scaling. Consider an example of a mixing tank, where we have a pilot scale, and we know how the pilot scale is designed and how it behaves and we want to scale it to a much larger scale that will have 1,000 times the volume of the pilot scale. We'll use the subscript 2 to represent the full scale and the subscript 1 to indicate the model pilot scale. How do we scale the tank diameter and the power for the mixer? To scale the tank diameter and the power for the mixer, we might predict that the tank diameter is some function of the volume and the power for the mixer is some function of the diameter a mixing rate that we'll call S, and the density of the fluid. We want the pilot scale and the full scale processes to be similar. That is, the dimensionless variables and other intensive quantities should be the same. In this case, we'll also keep the mixing rate the same in both tanks. The mixing rate has dimensions of reciprocal time. First, let's consider how to scale the tank diameter. Since we said the tank diameter is a function of the volume, then we need to formulate a dimensionless quantity representing the relationship between volume and diameter. We can de-dimensionalize volume by dividing it by diameter cubed, and we'll call that dimensionless parameter pi1. Then we decide to keep pi1 constant for the pilot scale and the full scale. This means that the volume of the first tank divided by its diameter cubed should be equal to the volume of the second tank divided by its diameter cubed. We can therefore solve for the diameter of the second tank if we know the diameter of the first tank. We already know the ratio of the volumes. It's 1,000. So that tells us that the diameter of the full scale tank should be 10 times the diameter of the pilot scale tank. While the volume of the full scale tank is 1,000 times the volume of the pilot scale tank, the diameter of the full scale tank is only 10 times the diameter of the pilot scale tank. Let's do the same thing for the power required for the mixer. The relationship between power, diameter, mixing ring, and density contains four variables that represent m equals three base dimensions, mass, length, and time. This means that according to the Buckingham Pi theorem, we should be able to formulate a single dimensionless quantity describing the relationship among these four variables that we want to hold constant between the pilot scale and the full scale. Power has dimensions of mass length squared per time cubed, diameter has dimensions of length, and the mixing rate has dimensions of reciprocal time. We'll choose as our basis set d, s, and rho, and then we'll formulate the three base dimensions by combinations of d, s, and rho. Of course, d gives us a length, and reciprocal s gives us a time. To get the mass dimension, we take rho times d cubed. Now we de-dimensionalize the power using these quantities for length, time, and mass. 
So the dimensionless power number must be p divided by rho d to the fifth s cubed. If we want to keep s constant across the scales, and we assume that the fluid density is the same at the pilot scale and the full scale, we can find the ratio of the power for the full scale model to the power used at the pilot scale. Remember that we already determined that the diameter for the full scale model is 10 times the diameter for the pilot scale model. So we can replace d2 here with 10 times d1. Remember that that's raised to the fifth power. Solving for the relationship between p2 and p1, we find that the power required at the full scale is 10 to the fifth times the power required at the pilot scale. So while the diameter only increases by a factor of 10, the volume increases by a factor of 1,000, and the power required for the mixer increases by a factor of 100,000. This ensures that the two processes are similar. Of course, this result may be ridiculous. If we need a one horsepower motor to run the mixer at the pilot scale, that means we need a 100,000 horsepower motor to run the mixer at the full scale. Imagine if your electricity bill were a dollar a month to run the pilot scale tank. Running the full scale tank would cost a hundred thousand dollars a month. So clearly we cannot keep the full scale and pilot scale models similar with respect to their power consumption. Instead, when scaling the pilot scale to the full scale, we may need to redesign the mixer. Maybe we use a different mixing rate. Or instead of increasing the volume by a factor of a thousand for a single tank, we use several smaller tanks in parallel. Using similarity for scaling is a very powerful concept that you will use as a chemical and biological engineer. Earlier, we introduced some dimensionless numbers. The Reynolds number, the Nusselt number, the Pranelt number, the Grashoff number, and the Brinkman number. On this slide, we summarize some other important dimensionless quantities that you'll encounter in your study of fluid dynamics, such as the Reynolds number, the Froude number, the Jotvos number, and the Weber number. These relate ratios of various forces that act on fluids. The Reynolds number we said is the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. The Froude number is a, is a ratio of buoyant forces to inertial forces. The Jotvos number is a ratio of pressure to inertia. And the Weber number is a ratio of surface tension forces to inertial forces. In mass transfer, we frequently encounter the Paclay number and the Sherwood number as ratios of transport rates, and Damkohler numbers as ratios of reaction rates to transport rates by convection and diffusion. These are the so-called type 1 and type 2 Damkohler numbers. In heat transfer, the Paclay number for heat transfer is analogous to the Paclay number for mass transfer. It's a ratio of heat transferred by convection to heat transferred by the diffusive flux or conduction. Similarly, the type 3 and type 4 Damkohler numbers for heat transfer are analogous to the type 1 and type 2 Damkohler numbers for mass transfer. And the Stanton number for heat transfer is analogous to the Sherwood number for mass transfer. It describes a ratio of heat transfer at an interface to heat transfer by convection. You don't have to memorize these numbers, but I'm putting them here to catalog them for you so that you can refer to them in the future. Finally, I want to end with a note on de-dimensionalizing theoretical model equations. We showed this by example when we introduced the tubular reactor, but we did not formally discuss a method for de-dimensionalizing equations. The first step is to identify the dimensions of all the dependent and independent variables. The fundamental dimensions are length, mass, time, temperature, and number of moles. Frequently, it's also useful to define energy as a base dimension, particularly when a process does not have any mechanism for converting thermal energy to mechanical energy. When thermal energy and mechanical energy can be converted, then energy should be formulated as mass length squared per time squared. Then we identify all of the combined dimensions as combinations of the base dimensions. So density, for example, is mass per length cubed. Next, we make a list of candidate characteristics for each of the dimensions. Maybe there's a characteristic length that we would use to de-dimensionalize other length scales in the process. 
or a characteristic mass, or a characteristic rate. We should choose different characteristics for orthogonal co coordinates of the same dimension. For example, if we have both radius and axial length in our coordinate system, we should choose a characteristic length in the axial dimension and a characteristic radius in the radial direction. If we have quantities representing concentrations of different species, then we should choose a characteristic concentration for each component. If two quantities in model equations are added and subtracted, then it's often convenient to choose the same characteristic for both of them. Then we rescale the left-hand sides of our equations to make each variable on the left-hand side dimensionless. This may or may not require use of all of our characteristic quantities. Rescaling the left-hand side of the model equations means multiplying and dividing the model equations by the characteristic variables. By rescaling the left-hand side to make it dimensionless, we will have also rescaled the right-hand side to make it dimensionless as well. Then we should check the ranges of our dimensionless variables. Sometimes it's convenient to combine variables so that the dimensionless variables scale from 0 to 1, for example. Finally, we should de-dimensionalize our initial conditions and boundary conditions using the same characteristics that were used to rescale the left-hand sides of the model equations, and identify the physical significance of the dimensionless parameters, like the list we talked about on the previous slide. In chapter 4 of the notes, we talked about principles for developing empirical models. We should choose simple functional forms of equations, reduce the number of parameters as much as possible while still capturing the system behavior, and recognize that we may need a substantial amount of data in order to formulate an empirical model. Remember that empirical models should not be used to extrapolate. We introduced the Buckingham Pi theorem as an important result from the field of dimensional analysis. The Buckingham Pi theorem determines how many dimensionless quantities are needed to represent a relationship among dimensional quantities. This approach can simplify empirical model building by reducing the total number of variables required. We can also use dimensional analysis for scaling. We did this with the stirred tank example.